Hey team, it's Andre from High Performance Academy and I'd like to welcome you all along to our Race Driving Fundamentals webinar. I'm going to give you a quick introduction here so you can know what to expect from today's webinar and while I'm doing that I'd love it if you could let us know in the chat whereabouts in the world you're joining us from and it'd be great to know what sort of cars you're also driving. I'll jump into the chat in a moment and make a few introductions and see who we've got in there. Before we do that though, I just want to mention that this lesson, this webinar today, we are hosting in conjunction with JG from Grassroots Motorsport Magazine. We're going to bring JG in in a few moments and get him to do an introduction so you can get an understanding of what his experience with race driving is and what exactly Grassroots Motorsport Magazine is. The lesson today is going to run for around about 45 minutes and we're going to cover a few of the key topics. When it comes to race driving and really what we're focusing on here is more at the grassroots enthusiast weekend warrior kind of level. And what we find, particularly for the majority of us who come from road cars and then want to maybe get involved with some track days on the odd weekend or maybe you even want to start competing in an actual series, there is a huge difference between the skill level that the average enthusiast has and what we see from a professional race driver. And you maybe think that you're cutting some exceptionally quick lap, lap times, but you'd be surprised usually if you actually put a pro driver in the car normally they're going to probably be a few seconds up the road quicker than you. However, there are some really simple aspects that we can focus on when it comes to improving our own race driving and that's what we're going to focus on during our lesson today. Now there's obviously a lot to take in here, we've diluted this down into some of the key aspects. So the first topic we're going to cover in detail is braking and brake application. And I know you're probably thinking to yourself, braking, how hard is this? It's pretty simple, right? Actually, this is one of the trickier aspects of race driving and the techniques that we use on the road, very different to what we use on the racetrack and this is one of the key areas that most enthusiasts will be giving away a huge amount of time. The second topic we're going to move into and it's a nice segue from braking is called trail braking or in other words how we release the brake pedal and this is as we bleed off the brakes as we begin to turn into the corner. Again, very different to our road driving techniques and there is a lot of time to be made up in trail braking. We can also manipulate the handling balance of the car with our trail braking. The last topic we're going to cover, if we've got sufficient time, we're going to look at some of the techniques we can use to improve our driving such as whereabouts to look, driver vision, and again this is something that most drivers at the enthusiast level simply overlook. But making sure that you're looking at the right part of the track is really critical. We'll also talk briefly about simulators and onboard video. Things that you can do to really improve your driving. At the end of the lesson we are going to run a question and answer session as well. We'll actually take some questions from the viewers while we're going through this. But at the end we'll have a more detailed rundown. So if there's anything that I talk about today or anything generally related to the topic of race driving. Feel free to ask those questions in the chat as we go. And we'll do our best to get to those. I will ask you to hold off with those questions until we get into these topics we will put a shout out for them. This is why we're just going to make sure that we don't miss any of them. All right, we'll quickly jump into our chat now and have a quick look and see who we've got joining us. Uh, we've got Marcus Hamilton and Joseph Ruth in here. We've got Eddie Rim Renisma, I think it is, driving a 2010 uh, Viper. Uh, we've got Max B in here. We've got Todd joining us. Todd Hayden joining us with an 03 Infinity G35. We've got Johnny Woods joining us with an 04 Honda Accord. Uh, we've got Mark joining us from Berryville. Uh, 10 minutes from Summit Point Motorsport Park. I've done a fair few laps around Summit Point on the simulator. I'd love to drive there in real life. It's an amazing track. Uh, Kevin Boswell joining us with a 92 Corvette. We've got Joshua Bigwood joining us from Alaska with an 05 uh, Forrester XT. And we've got Samuel joining us from Chicago, Illinois with a 2016 4.7 Ford Fusion. I'll leave it there because otherwise I'm going to spend the rest of our lesson just introducing people and welcoming them along but it is great to have so many of you online and while I'm talking about this as well if you are watching on our website today not YouTube then you will see at the top of the chat there is a blue Facebook sharing button. I'd really appreciate it if you could take a moment out of your time to punch that button. It's going to let your friends on Facebook know that you're watching this lesson today and if your friends are anything like you are chances are they 
they'll also enjoy coming along and joining in. And why that's important is when we get to our Q&A session, the more people we've got online, the more questions we're going to get, the more answers JG and I will be able to provide, and this way everyone's going to learn more. All right, with our brief introduction there out of the way, what I want to do is just step back a little bit and give you a quick idea on who High Performance Academy is. As I said, we'll bring JG in in a moment as well. He can introduce himself in grassroots motorsport. And uh, for, for those who aren't aware, High Performance Academy is an online training school. Uh, we are actually streaming from Queenstown, which is in the South Island of New Zealand. So opposite side of the world to JG from grassroots motorsport. High Performance Academy, as I mentioned, online training school. We've been in business now for about eight years and over the majority of those years, we've been focusing on teaching people how to tune EFI, how to build performance engines and also how to complete quality, reliable wiring harnesses. We had a lot of questions over the time though on topics related to race driver education. So we have branched out over the last two years. We now offer courses on race driver education, race driving techniques, which is what we're focusing on today, as well as car setup, uh, suspension wheel alignment, and also how to improve your car and your driving with data analysis. Uh, over the eight odd years that we've been in business at this point, we've helped about 75,000 people from all around the world who have joined up and taken our courses learn those topics that I've just mentioned. And today we are focusing on the race driving fundamentals side of our business. And for those who enjoy what you learn as we go through this, uh, we also have a really special webinar package deal that we're going to offer at the end. It's gonna be perfect for those of you who like what you see and want to take your knowledge to the next level. However, there's gonna be a lot of juicy information in here regardless whether you buy that package or not. It is important before we move on just to mention that I personally am not a professional race driver. I am a budding enthusiast, so probably similar uh, to a lot of you who may be watching. I have been racing for a fair while, started when I was about 12 or 13 with carts. Uh, I just want to quickly jump across to my laptop screen and show you the most recent car that we have been driving. Uh, this has been evolved over a few years of ownership now. It is a 2013 Toyota GT. 86. I started out with a 4 litre Toyota V8 and more recently we have fitted to it a Nissan SR20VE turbo engine. Obviously as you can see, uh, got a bit of aero on the car now as well. Uh, so we've got that uh, SR20 sitting in there, 2 litre still to fit in the class that we want to run with. It's got a Garrett GT30 turbocharger. Uh, for endurance racing, which is what we're using it for, we're making around about 450 wheel horsepower, running about 15 psi of boost. And just to show that I can actually steer a car reasonably well, we're actually fresh off a win at the first round of our local endurance series, which was held at our local racetrack. So uh, pretty excited to get that win under our belt. So again, I'm not a professional driver. What we've actually done for our Race Driving Fundamentals course is we've teamed up with uh, a professional driver. And because I've got that understanding of what we need to know from an enthusiast level, basically we distilled their 20 years of uh, race driving knowledge and presented a course with all of the information that I know personally as an enthusiast, I wanted to know in order to be able to help improve my own driving. Just a point there, that course has done exactly that. With that course, I actually managed to end up reducing my lap times at our local track by about a second. So just to give you an idea of what is actually possible. All right, enough talking about myself though. Let's get JG in here. So we'll bring JG in. Welcome along, JG. Thanks for hosting this webinar with us. And uh, obviously we're going out to the GRM uh, viewers as well. Can you start maybe by just giving us a really brief rundown on what Grassroots Motorsport is, please? Oh, I'd be happy to. So, uh, and actually that that uh, Toyota 86 is the perfect segue because you know that that is a car that if you are into cars like that, uh, you are a grassroots motorsports fan. Like our our magazine, it's a U.S.-based magazine. Uh, we're out of the Daytona Beach, Florida area, although we cover amateur motorsports all over the U.S. Um, but we have a worldwide readership because we cover not only you know competition that takes takes place in in the U.S., but our main focus is on 
on tech, on driving techniques, on how to exist in this world of amateur motorsports that we're all trying to do. You know, Andre mentioned that he's not a professional race car driver, and neither am I, but both of us have been doing it for a good portion of our lives, and we've devoted a lot of effort to it. And so have a lot of our readers and and a lot of our viewers. And I've seen a lot of names uh, in in the in the comment section of folks that I've shared a track with before. So we're a pretty knowledgeable group of of track enthusiasts. So when we were kind of sat down to to work on the, the program tonight, I was I was kind of getting the HP Academy folks to to go a little more granular, a little more hardcore. A, because that's kind of what I wanted to, to, to see, and B, because, you know, our our fans, our readers are a real knowledgeable group, and they, they appreciate really solid, really granular, really detailed information. So uh, if, if you're into the kind of stuff we're talking about tonight, if you're into cool cars and cool stuff to do with them, uh, whether it's, you know, time trial, time attack, road racing, uh, autocross or slalom or whatever you, you call it in the country that uh, you happen to be watching from tonight. Check us out online at grassrootsmotorsports.com and uh, we will we will hook you up from there. If you can't subscribe to the print magazine because you're across the ocean, you can subscribe to the digital edition or you can just consume the content on uh, on our website. So, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks to HP Academy for having us along tonight. And thanks to the GRM regulars who are, are here getting to check out something a little bit new tonight. Perfect. All right. Thanks for that, JG. And uh, yeah, be sure to check out Grassroots Motorsport magazine. Let's jump into our actual lesson. And before we get into brake application, what I just wanted to mention here, which I think is something I've seen through my whole career, I didn't mention that prior to founding High Performance Academy, I owned a performance workshop. So we tuned and dealt with a lot of race cars. And one of the things I see a lot of enthusiasts fall into the trap of is trying to improve their lap times by adding more power to the car. And yes, that's going to work. But time and time again, I find the cheapest form of improving your lap times is actually focusing on your own driving. And also, if your driving is better, you're going to actually be able to extract more out of a more powerful car. If you're not a very competent driver, adding more power can actually be pretty dangerous. So I just wanted to clear that up. This is honestly the cheapest form of lap time you're going to find. So let's get into brake application as our first topic and I'll just remind you again, we're going to be stopping through this, we'll bring JG back in and we'll t cover a couple of questions as we go. So if you do have questions, we're going to restrict this purely to this topic right now. We'll have more general questions at the end, but feel free to ask any questions on brake application, we'll jump into those. So as I mentioned at the start, this is one of the most common areas that the average track day enthusiast is just giving away bucket loads of time during the lap, and it might not seem uh, that obvious initially. A lot of the problem comes from people who have spent a decade or so driving their street car around on the street and the problem is that the braking application, the braking technique we use on the street is vastly different to what we need to use on the racetrack. So let's just dive over to my laptop screen for a moment here and we'll just have a look at a, a quick graphic. This is some data which I'm going to be showing you quite a bit of data as we go. Don't get too worried about it, I'm going to explain exactly what we're looking at uh, as we go and we'll, we'll sort of get an understanding of why that's important. So let's have a look at our brake pressure trace here and what we've got here the white line is from a pro driver and the red line is from an amateur driver. So what we've got here is, sorry actually we've got it around the other way, what we've got is the white line is from the amateur driver, the red line is from the pro, that's going to make a lot more sense. So a couple of obvious issues here with this data. First of all our amateur driver here has got on the brakes way earlier, don't have the number here but this is about 17 meters difference on the racetrack so that's a huge distance difference where the driver is actually getting on the brakes. The other thing we can see is that the actual brake trace looks a bit different. Uh, the brake pressure gradually builds up and we can see the actual peak pressure here compared to the red line which is our pro uh, also vastly different. So what that results in, we will, the difference we can see is where the pro jumps on the brakes obviously much later as we've already mentioned and the pro builds up that pressure 
peak pressure is a lot higher. So what this allows the driver to do is first of all hold more speed into the initial part of the braking, that's why he can brake later, and then because of that additional pressure essentially the driver is using more of the available retardation from the tyres, more of that available grip to slow the car down quicker. So he can hold more speed into that initial part of the corner but still actually slow the car down to the correct speed to get through the apex. And then we've got the bleed off of the brakes which we're going to talk about in a bit more detail. So that's a really key difference. The, the takeaways there, amateur drivers generally they're going to get on the brakes too early and they're going to build up pressure too slowly and also not get anywhere near uh, the maximum amount of retardation or grip that are available from the tyres. Basically not exploiting the amount of grip that's there. And again a lot of this comes from road car driving technique and a bit of a fear which is understandable when we get out on the racetrack. Now if we look at how this actually affects the car speed, this is our next slide here, so we're coming up to our top trace here which is our car speed. Essentially everything we do with our driving technique when we're trying to reduce our lap times is all about keeping more car speed, maximising our car speed through the lap. So let's have a look at a couple of elements here. So first of all we can see this green trace here that I've just highlighted, this is where the amateur driver has jumped on the brakes and what we can also see is the amateur driver already is a little bit slower at the braking point. The professional driver's braked here, at that point they're holding around about 8 to 10 kilometres an hour more speed. I will apologise for those of you who work in Imperial but I think you could probably understand the magnitude of these numbers. The key point here though is with this braking technique, as I've already mentioned, by the time the pro driver is off the brakes we can see that the speed has actually matched the amateur driver. So a couple of takeaways there, the amateur driver actually seemingly here has about the right speed to get through the apex of the corner which is the slowest point of the corner but they've taken a lot longer to slow the car down to that point. The pro driver has got on the brakes later, more aggressively, slowed the car down quicker so he's been able to brake later but still get down to that minimum speed and really the gain in lap time is going to come from the delta between these two speed traces during that braking phase. This can be massive, it's not uncommon to see the difference in that delta there just in one braking segment as much as 3 to 5 tenths of a second and you add that up over all of the braking zones around a racetrack and understandably that's a huge amount of time that the amateur is giving away. Alright so we'll move on now as well and we'll just get an understanding of this is a slightly more advanced topic but an understanding of how the actual tyre works and why we want to be right on the limit of the tyre's adhesion. So let's look at our next slide and this topic here relies on an understanding of the term slip ratio. So uh, basically what we need to understand here is that the amount of grip that the tyre provides which is obviously what we're trying to, uh, to uh, optimise when we are under brakes is relative to its slip ratio or how it's slipping across the racetrack. So you might think that if we've got the tyre slipping across the racetrack we could consider this to be a partial lock up or an under rotation of the wheel, that's not something that's going to be beneficial but when we actually look at this plot here uh, we find that a small amount of slip is actually an advantage. So what we've got here on the horizontal axis is our slip ratio. Essentially how much faster or slower the tyre is rotating relative to the racetrack that it's moving across. Uh, so down at the bottom here we've got braking and of course up the top here we've got acceleration. So we actually see this uh, in both acceleration and braking and the key point here is that we can see what happens is that around about 5%, it's not always going to be 5%, it's going to be very dependent on the uh, tyre, uh, we end up with a maximum amount of longitudinal force, so that's the point we're actually interested in here. So by getting a little bit of under rotation we can actually end up with more longitudinal force, more braking force and we can slow the car down faster. This segues into two different topics here. First of all if we considered a professional driver, let's take someone at the top of their game in Formula 1, 
they will actually purposely use this to their advantage, trying to get a slight under rotation of the tyres in these bigger, bigger braking zones so that they can maximise that longitudinal force, get the maximum braking force available. For the average enthusiast and the track day warrior, this is probably not a technique I would suggest you want to start focusing on because what it does is it has us right on the edge of locking up the wheels. I just want to explain that this is a situation that's actually happening with our tyres and the amount of force or grip that they provide is dependent on their slip ratio. So going too far here is obviously going to end up locking a wheel. When we lock up the wheels, the longitudinal force dramatically reduces. If we're locked up the front of the car, we also no longer have any steering. So it is a fine line, but that's where we're trying to aim for. This is also what motorsport spec ABS systems are actually trying to achieve. They're trying to get those tyres, all four of them, to be constantly on the optimal slip ratio. So that's kind of an understanding of what's actually going on with the tyres. We're going to get into a couple of questions in just a moment on this topic. Uh, I, will want, I do want to just cover on one more aspect here which is again really easy to overlook with our braking and this is actually what happens before we ever get onto the brake pedal. So let's have another look at some data here and what we're looking at here is the transition between our throttle and our brake pedal. Now, most drivers at the enthusiast level aren't left foot braking so we're using the same foot on the throttle as we're using on the brake pedal. And what we want to do here is just be mindful when we're on the track that when we're coming up to a big braking zone we're actually obviously starting from full throttle acceleration so we're accelerating up to our braking marker. And a lot of enthusiasts their tendency will be to quite slowly transition off the throttle and then there'll be a period of time, maybe a couple of tenths of a second, where they're neither accelerating nor braking, and then they'll transition their foot across to the brake pedal and then go through what we've already looked at, that slow gradual build up in pressure and not getting enough peak pressure. So we can see here that transition, and this is pretty typical here, uh, we've got maximum throttle there, and it's not until this point here where there is a little bit of brake pressure started to be applied. So just being conscious of this when you're out on the track, understanding that particularly at the end of a long straight where the car's traveling really fast, is covering a lot of ground every second or every tenth of a second. So the quicker we can transition from our throttle pedal to our brake pedal, the later we're going to be able to brake. And again, just like we looked at in that previous slide, that's going to give us uh, an improvement in our entry speed and that's going to result in a reduction in our lap times. Alright so enough talking from me, let's bring JG back in here and uh, we'll have a quick chat about that and first of all JG have we got any, any questions on that or anything that you wanted to maybe note about that topic of braking so far? So yeah we actually have some, some great questions that uh, we'll get to in a second, I'm trying to mentally organize them here because we have some, some great topics that uh, some of the viewers sure want to cover but you know so actually to get right into this one of the the things that i whenever i'm doing any instructing and the one of the first things i tell people that you sort of alluded to already is the the brakes i don't care how much horsepower your car has your brakes are still your most powerful speed changing device on your car absolutely um so you know you use them respectfully in that regard so uh the uh, the, the thing that I think it's lost in my description, though, is more correctly, your brakes are actually also the most powerful uh, sort of weight transfer device on, on your car as well. So with, with yeah. that in mind, let's uh, – John Gordos has a great question about brake application for front-wheel drive versus rear-wheel drive, which – could be a whole other discussion in itself, <laughs> but before we get, get too deep into that, um, just just a, address that a little bit and, and some of the some of the peculiarities yeah. about about front wheel drive versus versus rear drive cars when it comes to what you can do yep. with the brakes. So I, I think this actually probably is going to be covered more in our next topic where we're talking about trail braking in terms of technique 
and, and that's where we do to potentially see some quite dramatic differences in technique and what we're wanting to do for front wheel drive versus rear wheel drive versus four wheel drive cars and it's more about manipulating the handling balance and the balance of the car at turn in particularly with front wheel drive cars uh, they do normally and naturally suffer from a tendency towards understeer so uh, some of what we do on the brake during turn in and the trail braking phase is all about getting the car to actually rotate into the corner and overcome that natural understeer I wouldn't necessarily say that the straight line hard braking phase uh, dramatically changes between front wheel drive, uh, rear wheel drive and four wheel drive though. Just, uh, just that part where we're actually trying to do our maximum braking in a straight line. That aspect for me, not a lot of difference in it. Obviously there's nuances here depending on the specifics of your car. And one thing I will just mention that, that I did overlook in, in the body I was just talking about there is that uh, when we say fast and aggressive brake application, I mean, th there are levels to this. We're not trying to treat the brake like a switch. It's not all or nothing. A and there is also a natural pitch frequency that each car will have. Uh, don't want to get too deep into that. It's a more complex topic that's outside of our scope today. But basically what I'm saying here is if you've got your stock road car that's softly sprung, uh, that's going to pitch at a different rate to a stiffly sprung race car. And the stiffly sprung race car will accept a faster application of the brake pedal. So we do, th th there's levels to this that we do need to understand. So John, I think there's going to be a little bit more of an answer to your question though, as I say, as we move into trail braking. So have we got another question there, JG? Yeah, let me, so let me combine a few here. We've got some good questions from, uh, from Chris and, uh, and, and Peter and, um, uh, actually two, two questions from Chris and a Chris from question from Peter regarding that, that sort of imminent lockup point and the, I'll, I'll try and combine all these, all, all what they're asking into a, into a single topic here. But yeah, they're, sure. they're they're sort of asking asking about is 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 that point where we're talking about where we're, we're getting a little bit of under rotation of the of the tire versus the road. You know, is that what we refer to as threshold braking? And is is that sort of what ABS is trying to to emulate? And it you know the 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 quick answer is. Yes, it is, but some ABS systems are better at it than others, and some of them are more tuned to saving you from hitting a snowbank on the side of the road yeah. uh, versus a, a motorsports ABS system, which is trying to actually produce better better lap time. So, so yeah, let's let's talk about sort of sort of how to manage that that point of incipient lockup. Either through sure. your foot and, and and skill versus with with an ABS system. Okay, yeah, uh, that in itself is a big topic. So let me just try and break that down. So uh, first of all, I'll just quickly cover ABS because as you've you've said, JG, quite rightly, they aren't all created equal, and a lot of road car ABS is absolute garbage on a racetrack. And as a driver, we're actually probably better to purposely stay away from that ABS engagement because it seems to be overactive and the reason for this is OE manufacturers they're not trying to optimize lap times their ABS tuning is really around driver comfort they don't want to upset the driver and they want to maintain steering input that's really the key uh, for a, a factory ABS system. Motorsport ABS on the other hand, as you mentioned, that, that is really focused on optimal performance, trying to get that slide under rotation, the optimal slip angle of the tire uh, and or slip percentage of the tire and also uh, is tunable. There's adjustability for the track, for the tire, wet versus dry. So uh, in a nutshell, I'll, I'll just cover that and leave it there. As I've said, I could talk for another half an hour on ABS systems. Uh, the, the technique of actually braking though, so obviously this is going to depend whether your car has ABS or not. And again, it's a pretty big topic. What I'd suggest here is, is the key is really building up slowly. Obviously, and that should go without saying, obviously uh, if you overcook this you could end up in the kitty litter and that's not really going to do much for your confidence and it's certainly not going to aid your lap times. The technique really is about finding a, a suitable braking marker on the track and using that as a reference point. This could be uh, a barrier change on the side of the track, it could be a change in the surface on the track or basically anything that's always going to be there lap after lap. 
pro tip here, don't, don't use a shadow. Those, those actually move during the day surprisingly, but a lot of people use shadows as a breaking marker. So then what we want to do, once we've got that breaking marker, use that as a reference and start breaking at or maybe just before that breaking marker. And you're going to get a sense as you get closer to the corner of whether you've basically braked too early. And the key you'll notice there is as you get closer to the apex, you're going to end up getting off the brake prematurely because you've realized that you've overslowed the car. Quite often this will actually be followed by a second application of the brakes as you get closer to uh, the apex. So that's a key thing to keep in mind. What are you actually doing on the brakes? And just understanding, thinking through what you've done and there, there's some red flags in there. You can of course go too far and one of the problems we see when we outbreak ourselves and brake too late is because we're still trying to slow the car down, we're, we're still applying too much braking force as we get to the turn-in point. And as we'll find as we get into our next topic, there's only so much grip the tyres have available so they can brake at maximum g-force, they can corner at maximum g-force but they cannot combine maximum braking and cornering at the same time. So what this results in, when we are starting to just, just outbreak ourselves, is the car will tend to understeer at corner entry because we're still asking too much braking for the tyres at the front of the car to be able to turn in. So that's my, my quick answer there. As I've said, I could probably talk for another half an hour on that topic, but uh, I, think, I think we'll probably move on from there. Again, we're going to cover some more of these questions uh, at, a, at a, a little bit later on in the webinar. So I think uh, if we're okay, we'll, we'll move on from there, JG. Uh, yeah, yeah. The, uh, there was there was a, a couple of things I want to sneak in there, and we'll, yep, we'll do that absolutely. later. But uh, yeah, thanks to everybody. And again, if you have questions, throw them in the chat, and and they'll get to us, and we'll try and get to everybody, or at least get to get to everybody's topic that they they bring up. And uh, also. Uh, you know, I, I just want to mention that um, HP Academy does a great job at not only doing these live webinars, but they are a fantastic resource to go to for not just driving stuff, but like everything from driving techniques to data acquisition to how to wire your race car, um, how to do a, a, an alignment properly, like. And not just how-to stuff, but deep into the, the the theory behind some of the stuff. It's actually a resource that that I use quite a bit when I'm sitting down to write a story. They're one of the first places that I will I will go to kind of get myself into the right right mindset when I, when it comes to researching some of these tech topics. So uh, they're they're a great source that we use too. And um, if you're looking, if you, I don't know if you guys are looking for a testimonial from me, but there you absolutely <laughs> sounds like we've got one. We have one, yeah. <laughs> Perfect. I appreciate the feedback there, JJ. All right, let, let's crack back on. So we're still at another couple of little topics that I want to talk about while we're on this breaking. So uh, let's just jump back into my laptop here, and we'll, we'll just talk about the differences here in braking for. A uh, conventional car that's maybe got little to no aero on it. So let's have a look at this brake trace we've got here. And we've got our brake pressure percentage. So what you can see, and there's the white line there sort of demonstrating this, is that the brake pressure is, is relatively consistent through the braking zone. Uh, it does taper off right at the end. This is our trail braking, which again we'll talk about separately. But basically, th there's no real downforce here on the car. So uh, the amount of brake pressure that we we use to stay on that point uh, of lockup, that threshold of lockup, can be pretty consistent. So it's quite easy once we find it to maintain it. However, if you do have the benefit of being able to drive a car with high downforce, this is quite different. Uh, obviously the downforce that the aero produces is a aspect of the speed that the car's going. So what this means is that we've got a lot more potential grip available from the tyres to slow the car down when we're doing let's say 140 mile an hour uh, compared to when we get down to maybe corner entry where we might be doing 30 to 50 mile an hour. So this is where we see this more tapered 
approach where initially we've got a very high level of initial brake pressure where there's a lot of grip available, a lot of downforce, the, the downforce might be producing maybe a thousand, maybe 1500 pounds of downforce. So that's forcing the car into the ground and that really helps our tyres grip. But of course as that downforce washes away we need to reduce our brake pressure uh, because otherwise we're going to end up locking up. So this is an aspect that probably at grassroots or enthusiasts we're probably not driving cars with massive amounts of downforce but even the modifications we've made to our own Toyota 8.6 we've got a top stage composites uh, diffuser, splitter and rear wing and uh, we've calculated that to be producing somewhere around about 600 kilograms of downforce at uh, 200 kilometres an hour so some of this element does come in it's just important to understand that concept because otherwise you're either not exploiting the amount of grip available at high speed or alternatively you're going to blow through and end up locking the wheels as uh, the speed bleeds off. The other aspect that is part of this is our braking technique for different parts of the racetrack. So uh, there's not a lot of black and white when it comes to race driving and we can't just go out and say that Every time we touch the brakes we want to be at maximum braking force and get there as quickly as possible. That is exactly what we do want to do for a large braking zone, maybe from maximum speed, maybe the fastest part of the racetrack where we're coming into a low speed corner. We want to slow the car up as quickly as possible. That's what we would want to do. And if we jump across to my laptop, uh, that's the sort of trace we can see with this grey trace here. So we've got that fast build up to maximum braking force and we can see the, the amount of braking force versus our red trace. So that's perfect for one of these big braking zones. But conversely, uh, if we are just wanting to bleed off a little bit of speed and we're already at high speed, uh, we'll have a different technique which is this red line that we can see in here. And you can see there we're not using anywhere near the amount of pressure and we're also not as quick to build up our brake pressure. So the reason for this is there might be a high speed part of the track which leads into a relatively high speed corner where we need to brush off a little bit of speed but not a massive amount. This technique that I've just shown you there, this is often referred to as brushing the brake pedal. If we were aggressive with our brake application under these conditions, the weight transfer or load transfer would really tend to upset the car. So a smooth application of our brakes, less outright brake pressure, it doesn't upset the car, it keeps everything balanced. So just important to understand that we need to adapt our technique based on the type of corner and where we are on the track. Uh, lastly as well, I just want to talk about uh, heel and toe downshifting. This is another area where we see a lot of enthusiasts go wrong when it comes to our brake application. Uh, I'll assume everyone's got an idea of heel and toe and what that is but essentially in a manual transmission it's the uh, matching of RPM for the lower gear by blipping the throttle while we're on the brake. So we've got our right foot, uh, the, heel, the ball of the foot will be on the brake pedal and then we're blipping the throttle with the heel. And this takes a little bit to get right. And what we will often see when we're not comfortable and familiar with that technique is exactly what we've got here. Uh, so we can see these big troughs in the brake pressure trace and these coincide with the throttle uh, blips that we can see up here. So trying to make sure that you're optimising your brake pressure application uh, during those zones so that you are not coming right off the brake pressure, uh, brake pedal and seeing those big dips in pressure like that. Uh, just understanding that that's something that you will be doing naturally to start with and focusing on it, that's usually enough to kick that habit or at least reduce it dramatically. Also important to mention here, uh, we can't expect perfection. Uh, I've seen brake traces from professional race drivers. Naturally there is always a little bit of a dip in the brake pressure anyway but uh, nothing as dramatic as what we can see there. All right, we're going a little bit long on this topic so the next one we're going to move into is uh, the release of the brake pedal uh, trail braking but before we do that uh, just a bit of a sum up there with you JG, we'll bring you back in. Uh, anything you want to add to the topic now that we've sort of completed that? Yeah, so I, I, I think the only... The, this actually segues nicely into a couple questions that we didn't quite get to the, the, yep. the first round but, but uh, let's expand just a little bit on on that initial application because um 
so one one thing I noticed in in the first the the, the first traces we showed there, and uh, somebody else caught caught this as well, is that even even our our pro driver trace had a little bit of an adjustment there on on the the uh, the the ramp up. And normally, what I would like to see, you know, as as an instructor critic, critiquing somebody's braking technique would be one nice steady up ramp for uh for that for that that brake application so the 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 question coming coming off of this is how do we how do we fine tune the uh the the speed of our of our brake application for for the corner we're approaching and obviously it's going to be a, a different application for every corner almost but how do we how do we know when we should be more aggressive on on that application or or less aggressive on, on that application and is it just a matter of how much weight we want to transfer how how quickly so I, I think a lot of it comes down to what we are coming up to and it sort of it alludes back to what I was talking about there. If you are looking, you know, every track's going to have perhaps one, two or maybe three uh, what I call maximum braking zones and these are normally from a relatively high speed section of the racetrack and we'll be approaching either a slow or a medium speed corner often into a hairpin. With that sort of corner or that sort of sector of the track, our focus there is trying to reduce the speed of the car as quickly as possible. And that is the sort of area where we would use an aggressive brake application. We want to get that brake pressure built up as quickly as possible. We are braking in a straight line and we're not going to be turning in until we've bled off a significant amount of speed. The other sort of brake application, uh, and the, there are levels to this, obviously there's, there's in-betweens as well, is that sort of area where we're probably at a, a medium to high speed leading into a relatively high speed corner where we're only trying to adjust our speed maybe by 10 to 20 percent. Uh, now the, the, the two aspects there is first of all we don't need to drop as much speed and the other one that sort of feeds into this just as importantly though is uh, that we don't want to upset the balance of the car. Uh, and that's where a big brake application is going to have a big load transfer towards the front of the car. It's going to unweight the rear of the car. And particularly at high speed if you're turning into a corner, uh, that's the sort of situation which is very likely to result in you ending up in a spin. So it's just understanding the, the effect that the... Uh, brake application is going to have on our weight transfer, which we're going to jump into very, very shortly. Uh, and and obviously, like anything, there's no black and white here. It is a case of actually testing to find, for a given particular sector of your own racetrack, what is going to work best. And we do cover this in, in more detail in our race driving fundamentals course. Obviously, here we're looking at a, a high level overview and trying to fit a, a lot into a, a 45 minute webinar. Yeah, absolutely. Right, so and uh, oh, so uh, there's just there, there's two more here that, that I'll, yep. I'll take real quick because they're, they're, uh, Chris has asked some great great questions tonight. He wants to know about braking technique changing with uh, a change in pad compound, and the easy answer there is if you think about your deceleration not in terms of brake pressure, but in terms of maybe your speed trace on on that data acquisition trace, you have an ideal speed trace for entering a, a corner. You just adjust your brake pressure to match that ideal speed trace. So more aggressive pads might mean less physical brake pressure, but don't forget that that less pressure may also mean a little bit different bias in in, in those brakes. So uh, tune your technique to to the speed trace with different pads, and then tune your tune your body to to the the pressure you know, re required to hit that ideal, ideal speed trace. And uh, Garrett wants to wants to know about uh, practicing heel toe um, yeah it one of worldwide one of the most difficult things that, that that people people find in learning how to drive fast is just finding the opportunities to do it um, it's easier than ever to get track time almost everywhere in the world but it's still not the easiest thing in in the world to do so you just really need to find your opportunities and and what you might need to do is dedicate one of your track weekends to saying, okay, the, I am working on specific techniques this weekend. I'm not going to worry about, you know, my apexes as much or my 
my track out as much. I'm just going to focus on getting my downshifts correct this weekend. And that's going to be the thing I work on this weekend and just sort of yeah. in, intensively study, study those things. I'll just talk so, to that for a moment. So, um, yeah. We've got a, a section where we, we do cover in our course the, the details on heel and toe and there's a couple of things I'll mention. So first of all, uh, doing this on your, in your road car, obviously I'm not advocating here speeding on the road, but doing it in your road car will help to a degree. It builds up some of that muscle memory but quite often what we then find is when we try and translate what we've learned on the road to the racetrack, it doesn't work quite as well. And the reason for this is that the, the braking uh, effort that we're putting into our road car if we're driving at road car speeds we're not slowing the car down anywhere near as quickly so we're not as aggressive on the brake pedal and we've got more time to physically match revs so help, learning in your road car helpful to a point but then as you mentioned you actually have to get out there and do it on the racetrack and the problem I know with a lot of enthusiasts is that learning that technique and practicing it uh, you're going to probably end up going slower before you go faster so it's it's just having that patience and probably put your lap timer away forget about your lap times as you've mentioned JG and just focus on the technique and, and perfecting it because I can guarantee you ultimately it is going to make you faster it can just be a frustrating learning curve the other thing I'll just quickly touch on is like that brake compound we've been through this ourselves and uh, there are a, a range of different compounds and different aggressiveness and uh, we ended up with a pad in one of our own cars that would have been completely undrivable in a car without ABS. It was designed for a high downforce car, a heavy car, uh, neither of which we had at the time. And basically the brake pedal just about became like a switch. As soon as you touch the brake pedal, uh, your head just about hit the windscreen and it was maximum retardation and the ABS was all over the show. So uh, choosing a correct compound can make a really big difference and matching it to uh, the type of car that you are driving. All right, we're, we're going to end up going a little bit long here, JG, so I'm just going to jump into our, our second topic here, uh, if that's okay, which is our trail braking or our, our brake release. Um, now, again, this is an area that is pretty overlooked by most enthusiasts because it's not a technique that we use when we're driving out on the road. Uh, when we're driving on the road, the, the usual technique is brake in a straight line and then get completely off the brake and then turn into your corner and that, that's absolutely fine and nice and safe on the road. Uh, when we apply that same technique to braking on the racetrack though, we are giving away a huge amount of potential time and also as we'll find, uh, it doesn't give us the benefit of being able to manipulate the handling balance of the car. So there's two aspects that go hand in hand with trail braking. So first of all, what am I talking about when I use that term trail braking? It's simply how we release the brake pedal as we begin to turn into the corner. So we're not treating the brake pedal like a switch where we're on the brakes, braking and then off. We're actually building up quickly and aggressively holding our brake pressure and then gradually tapering that away and we just need a bit of a background understanding of what's actually going on in terms of grip from the car as we do this. So let's head across to my laptop screen. To make things really easy what we've got here is an overhead view of one of our Toyota 8.6s and you can see we've got this number here 25 on each corner of the car. So what we're doing is making it really simple. Let's assume that overall the car has 100 units of what I'm going to call grip doesn't really matter the physics behind this, let's just assume that overall we've got 100 units of grip. Now let's look at what happens when we brake hard. So here we've got our lateral and longitudinal g-force so we can see our g-force has gone right forward so we're heavy braking there and what we can see is our units of grip on the front we've increased to 33. The, the magnitude doesn't matter just try and understand the concept. At the same time at the back of the car it's reduced to 15. Now this is because the way the tyres work, and we'll have a look at this in a second, essentially what we gain on the more heavily loaded end of the car, the front of the car where all the weight has been transferred forward to, the amount of grip we gain there is less than what we lose at the rear of the car. So if we look at this quick calculation, we had 100 units, you'll remember when the car was static. Now we've only got 96, so we've actually lost a little bit of overall grip. So that's what's happening under brakes. Let's have a look 
at when we turn this time to a left hand corner so we can see our lateral g-force we've gone across to the right so of course what that's done is it's more heavily loaded the right hand side of the car again for real simple numbers we've kept them the same and we get the same situation here we've only got 96 units of grip so we've actually lost a little bit so this is something that is so easy to overlook any time we're turning the car, braking or accelerating, we want to minimise the weight transfer as far as possible because that's going to give us the maximum amount of grip. And why that works like this is because we need to understand what's happening with our tyres. So, just let me explain this little graph I've got here. On the horizontal axis we've got the vertical load, so the amount of vertical load on the tyres, so of course when we brake we get more vertical load on the front tyres, less on the rear. We've got in green our coefficient of friction, so that's the amount of friction between the tyres and the road surface and then sort of a combination of this is our lateral force, the amount of force that the tyres the can generate is shown here. We're talking lateral but longitudinal, the same thing. So let's just quickly have a look here. Let's say we start with 2,000 newtons of load on the front wheels. We get on the brakes and we increase that to 4,000 newtons. So the important thing and that's really represented by our last little uh, graphics, our last little slides, is that when we double the vertical load on the tyres, we don't double the amount of grip available, we don't double the amount of force, longitudinal force that the tyres can generate and that's because our coefficient of friction actually drops away as the vertical load increases. Okay so that's the first concept we need to understand, anytime we've got weight transfer in the car we're actually reducing the overall amount of grip. The next thing we need to understand is this concept called the traction circle. And you'll probably hear this talked about a fair bit and all it is is a XY graph here where we've got uh, lateral g-force uh, on our horizontal axis left and right hand and then we've got longitudinal g-force acceleration and braking on our vertical axis. So this gives us a combined indication of what the grip of the car is, what, what's actually happening and what we can see here is that let's say for this particular car we can get this amount of maximum braking force. Also we can get this amount of lateral cornering force, doesn't really matter what the specific numbers are but you can see that we can generate that amount of grip. The problem is that the tyres only have so much grip available so while we can generate maximum braking force or maximum cornering force we cannot do both together. So if we want to start out braking and then move into a right hand corner in order to free up some available grip from the front tyres to allow the car to start turning what we actually have to do is reduce our braking force slightly and then what we can do is we can come out here and we can generate some cornering force. Ultimately what that allows us to do is kind of ride around this rim of the traction circle and the more of that area that we can use the better. Let's take that road car example I gave where we do all of our braking in a straight line so basically that allows us to use this area of our traction circle and then once we've got off the brakes then we're going to turn into the corner so that allows us to use this area. Obviously what that means, oops I don't want that, well, obviously what that means is that we're not exploiting the amount of grip available when we get to the turn in point of the corner. So this is where trail braking comes in and our first point here is just about maximising uh, the lap times or minimising our lap times I should say by exploiting all of that available grip. Essentially what we want to do is as we get to our turn corner turn in we want to gradually bleed off the brake pedal as we are simultaneously adding our steering lock. And that should be quite a natural feeling once we understand what's going on. You could almost think of it like a piece of string attached between your brake pedal and your steering wheel and as we reduce the brake pressure that allows us to use more and more of our steering lock. What that looks like here, we've got our brake pressure plot and we've got our steering angle below. So you can see that there is actually an overlap here. Uh, we've got our ma maximum braking pressure point here and as we get to this point here we're starting to bleed off that brake pressure at about the same rate we're starting to add steering lock. 
And basically during the trail braking area, we're going to be completely off the brake, uh, just as we're sort of starting to come up towards the apex. Uh, on the right hand side, we've got a, a bit of a line showing what that actually looks like with steering angle on the X axis and our brake pressure on the vertical axis. So it's all about optimizing the performance of the car and the speed of the car at turn in. Now, that's all well and good, but the other aspect here that plays into this is optimizing our handling balance. So optimizing how the car is actually handling. So let's say we've got a car that suffers from uh, oversteer at turn in corner entry. So what that generally means is that we don't have enough grip at the rear of the car. So we can manipulate our brake input during the trail braking phase to account for that. If we get off the brakes a little bit earlier with our trail braking, what that's going to do is transfer load towards the rear tyres, giving more grip at the rear tyres and reducing the tendency for the car to oversteer. So this is where some of those subtleties around the technique of trail braking and corner entry for a front wheel drive versus a rear wheel drive versus four wheel drive do come into play. On the other hand, if we've got a car that is tending to understeer, by trail braking, what that's going to do is twofold. First of all, it's adding more load to our front tyres, giving us more grip. Secondly, it's also reducing the grip from the rear of the car, which will tend to uh, reduce the amount of traction available there, and that can help the car rotate into the corner. So it's a really important technique to understand, not just from purely a lap time perspective, but also from being able to subtly change that handling balance. And even during a, a race, if we've got a fuel load that's burning off, by adjusting that handling balance uh, using our trail braking technique, that can and also get the, get the most out of the car. All right, I've talked a lot there, JG. I'm sure you've got a bit to add to this, so we'll bring you back in. What's your thoughts there? Yeah, yeah. so uh, we, have, we have some dynamite questions to get to get to here. No, there, there, there's, there, there's a lot of great information there, and I want to I wanna start with, with Max's question here. We're, a lot of the stuff we're seeing tonight is sort of dependent on having, having good data acquisition in in the car and max is asking about uh what's a good data acquisition system to use how hard is it to yep. to install and the one of the best answers to that i can give right now is that it has never been a better time to go shopping for data acquisition systems because they are absolutely more plentiful yeah more plentiful and more available than ever before and for for me i i think the the minimum that i need from a data system is if i have if I have a speed trace and uh, a, a G circle, I can I can set up a car. I can I can improve my driving. I can do I can do a lot from from there. So even something like an Apex Pro, even some of the phone based acquisition systems like Harry's Lap Timer um, are, yeah. are are fantastic. Um, what 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 do you guys like 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 how do, how do you walk somebody through the the process yeah. of, of picking a data acquisition system? Okay, so again, I could talk for an hour on this. Uh, we, we actually include, we've got two uh, data analysis courses because this is so such an important way of improving your lap times. However, uh, I know one of the things that puts a lot of people off is, is the cost. And honestly, these systems can be as cheap or as expensive as you want them to be. The other thing I would say is so important, particularly when you're starting out, when it comes to data, less is actually more. And I know that might sound counterintuitive, but the more data we've got to look through, the easier it is to get lost in that data. And I'd 100% agree with you. Uh, if you've just got a lateral longitudinal G-force plot and you've got a corrected speed trace, that's a huge amount of data to get started with and you're not gonna get confused. At the entry level, as you mentioned, Harry's lap timer. The other one, we've actually got a worked example in our data analysis course using a phone-based app from HP Tuners, which is Track Addict. Uh, very, very powerful tools for uh, not a lot of money. And let's be honest, everyone's got a phone these days. So uh, that's going to give you video as well. So really powerful. Uh, the next step up the, the rung that we really like is the AIM Solo 2 or AIM Solo 2 DL. 
I forget the specifics, but I think around 400 US dollars is gonna get you one of those. Really, really powerful, and they're also portable, so you can share one with a buddy and cut down on the costs. Uh, the examples that I've given you there in the webinar so far are from a more high-end system. This is a Motec system, and you don't need to be spending Motec money. And also, the other important thing to understand, regardless whether you're using a phone-based app or Motec or Pi Research or any of the high-end brands from Bosch, uh, the techniques of actually analyzing the data are exactly the same. So uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot, lot of low-hanging fruit there that doesn't end up needing to cost you the earth. All right, um, we've probably got time for one more question there if you've got one JG and, and otherwise we'll crack on because we are just going to run a little bit long otherwise. Yeah, okay, so let's, uh, if, if that's the case, let's go with this, uh, this question from, uh, from Roger and uh, he wants to, he says that there's no single answer for every part of a track but is trail braking always used on, on every type of, of, of corner um, or is trail braking only, only useful in, in certain types of corners? And um, I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to let you take this one from the beginning because I, I have thoughts on this, but but my as a as a longtime autocrosser, my my thoughts may not may not match with with what what uh, message you you want to put out there, Andre. So. All right, all right. I, I, I'm also interested to hear your view on it. And again, just yeah. remembering, I am not a a driving instructor here. Uh, yeah. I'm I've been learning from from our own courses from our pro driver. Uh, so I think Roger's probably nailed it in so much as there is no single answer. Uh, a lot of it is going to depend on the track and a lot of it is also going to depend on your car and the imbalances that your car may have or uh, tendency towards understeer or tendency towards oversteer and whether you need to uh, get rid of those tendencies or modify those tendencies. Uh, you mentioned autocross there as well, Roger, uh, sorry, JJ, not Roger, uh, which is, is a form of motorsport that, that I have not been involved with, but uh, uh, usually I think it'd probably be safe to say typically a bit lower speed than road race applications out on a dedicated full-time race circuit. So uh, here's what I'd probably say is that uh, we're more likely to use uh, trail braking uh, pretty significantly in some of those higher braking zones where we're going from high speed down to low speed and turning into a corner, uh, maybe a tight corner and that's also an area where we're probably going to have the the most trouble maybe rotating a car into the corner and that's where trail braking can come in and be helpful uh, my other example which is kind of about the the same with the braking application where a high speed corner where we're only trying to brush off a little bit of speed uh, that would probably be an area where we'd be less likely to use trail braking so significantly uh, how, how's that sort of match with your thoughts on the the topic jj yeah, I, I I tend to agree. I w I would say you know at as your skills increase, your the time you spend on the the outer circumference of that friction circle is also going to going to increase. And the the real yep. answer is in the middle of that friction circle is there are no trophies in the middle of that friction circle. So the more no. the more time you yeah the more time you spend on the perimeter, the more time you're going to spend on on the podium. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So, so I yeah, agree. always if you're if you're if you're in a position where you're only doing one thing, then you you better be in the middle of, of a straightaway. Otherwise, always always try and and use every every bit of what that tire has has to give give yeah. to you. So, but yeah, okay. great 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 questions from everybody. So I, I and we'll I'll, I'll go in in the chat and and address a couple of these too because some of them are worth. Worth, worth talking about while, while you, you cover this next part, which is also very, very, very good. <laughs> I, will, I will mention, we're still going to have a, a dedicated Q&A session on wider topics uh, very, very shortly. We're, we're just about ready to wrap up. And uh, I will just cut this a little bit short because we are running a little long. So I've got one more topic because I think this is really important and another area that uh, the average novice is really overlooking, which is driver vision or where we are looking on the racetrack. So we'll just jump across to my laptop and and um, I'll just show you this, this is actually from a module in the Driving Fundamentals course and um, this is our pro driver actually showing on our local track whereabouts we should be looking. So I'm just going to play this, if I can play this, let's see if we can, there we go. So that's, that's awkward isn't it, let's just come back here and we'll see if we can, if we can do this full screen. Maybe we can, maybe we can't, no my bar is 
blocking it. That's all right. Let's just play this inside here. So we're coming up here, and the first thing we're looking at, or the first mistake I should say that most novices are doing, is they're looking way too close to the front of the car. And this is particularly a problem when we are at high speed. This point that we're coming up to here is about 120 mile an hour, 200 kilometers an hour. And we find most drivers are really focused quite narrowly just at what's happening just off the end of the car in front of them. And that's a big problem. What we want to do is always focus on getting our vision out further, further up the racetrack. And this is important because it gives us a wider understanding of what's happening. We'll feel less rushed and we can also make necessary adjustments quicker. We're not going to be surprised. So while it's a little bit hard to see here, what we're actually looking at here, Andrew, our pro driver, is already focused his attention on the, an orange marker that we're going to be coming up to. This is the turn-in point for this first corner. So let's get a little bit closer. So that's that marker there we're just, that Andrew's just passing now. So we always want to be one phase ahead of what we're doing. So now that we're, we're basically coming up to that turn in marker, we're already taking our attention off and while it's a little bit tricky to see just now, uh, we're coming up to a, a chicane or a, a right left uh, complex called the bus stop. So we're already looking at that next zone which we'll just come up to here and we've got two curbs that we're going to run over. And so we're already lined up for this right hand curb, so Andrew's already got his vision up the road further to this next curb, uh, the next point that we're going to be cutting across. And each time when we get to that point, you can see that that vision point has moved. So we're now looking at the exit curb here of the bus stop. We'll get through this, and once we're there, our next curb, the apex that we're going to be hitting, and now Andrew is looking as far around this corner here called the Southern Loop as he possibly can. Basically trying to spot the exit, it's probably a little bit inaccurate here, probably actually more up here towards the corner exit at this point. And always just keeping that vision one zone or one uh, phase ahead of what we're doing at the particular point in time. This is really simple as to, in terms of a concept, but it is really, really easy to forget, really easy to overlook. And particularly when things are going wrong, uh, it's very easy to find that you've actually pull, pulled your vision back. So one of the things to always keep in your mind if you are having a problem with a particular corner, uh, maybe you're not able to hit your apex, maybe you're missing your brake marker, maybe you're running wide on your corner exit, Always think to yourself, where am I looking through that corner? And make sure that you're always focused ahead. It's a really easy way to completely run wide and miss an apex if you're simply not looking at the apex. Uh, there's, there's something I always like to keep in my head is that the car will end up going where we're looking. Which is why when things go wrong and you end up uh, in a spin, uh, looking at the tree that you don't want to hit is a pretty surefire way of ending up hitting that tree or the barrier or whatever it is that... Uh, that you don't want to hit. So always look where you want the car to go and always try and keep your vision one phase up the road. All right, JG, we'll give you, uh, get, get you back in here again and, and any thoughts on that? What, what do you see in your terms of uh, race driver instruction in terms of where your students are looking? Yeah, so it, it's it's interesting because it, sort of straddling the worlds of, of autocross and, and track, um, events we, we we see a lot of folks that that have really good habits that they have to adjust to different situations autocrossers are, are naturally very good at looking ahead but because of the of the density of control inputs in an autocross or a slalom situation you know you're you're doing something every every half a second ver versus on a road course you're doing something every two or three seconds so while autocrossers are really really good at looking ahead sometimes they're not looking far enough ahead on on a road course the thing that you realize when you get to a more open road course is while you're going much faster things happen much much slower but they happen for a longer period of time. You're, you know, you're in a corner for several seconds, and once, you, once you're in a corner somewhere, there's very little you can do about what's actually happening at that very moment. So, um, you, you really need to concentrate, you know, uh, uh, further ahead based on based on whatever speed you're you're doing. And the another thing that I see quite a bit is people that are very good at at looking looking ahead the proper amount but will then fixate on that target 
as it gets closer to them. So they'll, they'll, they'll approach a corner. They'll, they'll find their exit, you know, right at, at turning and look, look at the exact right place, but then they'll watch that exit all the way, all the way, way by and forget to, to reset that, that uh, gap for how far they're looking ahead. So yeah. Yeah. Rem- remember that, you know, look, looking ahead is a thing that needs to sort of constantly update as you're, as, as, as you're moving through, through a, through a circuit. Yeah. I'll, I'll just also mention something I, I overlooked to, to state there is it, it's not just about getting your, your breaking points, your apexes and your corner exits spot on. Uh, when you're racing in traffic as well, keeping your vision further down the track, you can, can get a sense of what's happening with the cars up ahead of you. And, and that's not just always about lining up an opportunity for a pass. Uh, if something goes wrong, someone gets tangled up in an incident ahead of you, uh, being able to see that and understand how it's unfolding, that's going to give you more of an opportunity to make a decision as to how to get out of the way, maybe how to capitalize on someone else's mistake and hopefully also uh, keep your car in one piece. Whereas if you're looking just off the end of the, the bonnet, uh, the end of the hood of the car, uh, that's much, much more difficult to do and it can easily result in an avoidable accident. Right, um, I, I think what we'll do here, again, I, I'm, I'm conscious of our time and appreciate everyone watching probably has other things to do. So I think we'll, we'll wrap up the, the body of our webinar here. Uh, don't go away though, as I mentioned, we do have more questions coming. I've already seen we've got a bunch of really great ones that have come through and we haven't been able to do justice to all of them yet. So don't worry, we're not going to miss those questions. And if you do have any questions, even if it's still on a broader aspect of race driving, we'd be happy to field those. Uh, so we'll get into those in a few moments. Now, before we do that, I just do really briefly want to cover off the, the fact I said at the start of the lesson for those who have enjoyed what you've learned so far and maybe want to take your knowledge to the next level. We have put together a very special webinar only package deal that's going to be perfect for anyone who is an enthusiast race driver and I just want to quickly cover that off. So uh, we'll just jump across to my laptop screen here for a moment and we've actually got three packages that are on offer uh, and I'll just cover them each briefly. We'll start with the center one which is our track day starter package and this is our most popular package uh, for those thirsty for knowledge and really want to improve your lap times. This is probably the best option for you. So we've got a bunch of courses we're including in this and we start with our race driving fundamentals course and essentially this is an expanded version of the webinar we've gone through today. You've seen some content from inside of the course that I've used uh, for our slides and our props but basically uh, we give you all of the knowledge distilled from a professional race driver and if you can't improve your lap times by uh, seconds, I would be imp- incredibly surprised. Now it's not all about driving though, there's other aspects that you can use to improve your performance. Uh, we are including our motorsport wheel alignment course which is valued at 129 US dollars as part of this package and the ability to adjust your wheel alignment particularly at the racetrack without breaking the bank is really important. Maybe you get to the track with a dry setup and it starts raining. Uh, Maybe you find that uh, your car might benefit from a little bit more negative camber on the right front corner uh, of a particular race track. This course will teach you how to make those changes using string alignment equipment that is not going to break the bank. A little bit more advanced but segueing out of our motorsport wheel alignment is our practical corner weighting course and this is something you'll see every professional race team doing to their car often several times during a race weekend. Most enthusiasts completely overlook it. Adjusting the corner weight and will have a massive effect on the balance of the car and also that, that sort of adds into the driver confidence. So uh, we'll teach you what corner weighting is, how the corner weights affect the performance of the car and then give you a step-by-step process along with worked examples so you can see that being done. We've then got our data analysis fundamentals course which is valued at 129 US dollars. Obviously you've seen data as we've gone through today's webinar and I cannot speak highly enough for data in terms of understanding what you are doing and what the car is doing out on the track. It makes it very very obvious to see where you're giving away time and a simple data system can pay for itself tenfold just with the improvements that you can see in your lap time. This course will teach you what data systems are, how to configure them, how to choose one, what sensors you will need 
and then how to analyze that data. We've also got a simple step-by-step -step process that you can apply to your own driving. Uh, we know that once you've actually got stuck in and started improving your driving or your car, you're going to have questions that crop up and we are here to help. That's why this package also includes 48 months of access to our members only forum, perfect place to ask your specific driving questions as well as our weekly members webinars where we cover a wide range of topics including driving, race car optimization, engine tuning and engine building just to name a few, a loan valued at $912 US dollars. So that uh, starter package there, total value of $1,368 US dollars for the next three days just to say thanks for coming along and watching this lesson. We're making it available for just $397 US dollars. This is probably the cheapest way to gain lap time in your car. We still understand though, it's a chunk of cash to come up with in one hit and we want to be able to help you improve your performance so we are also offering a payment plan option. You can break that up into eight weekly payments of just 49 US dollars a week. We also understand when it comes to purchasing online education like this, it can be a little bit daunting. Obviously, you don't know exactly what you're getting and we want you to be able to purchase with complete confidence and zero risk, which is why we also offer a 60 day no questions asked money back guarantee. There is zero risk in giving these courses a test drive. Right, so that's our first package there. Uh, as I've said, suitable to the majority of you probably who are watching, but we've got two other packages. On the right hand side, we've got our VIP package, and this is gonna be perfect for those of you who really have a massive thirst for automotive performance knowledge. This package will give you access to every single course that High Performance Academy currently offers. Not just race driver education and car setup, engine building, engine tuning, wiring, and we've got a bunch of other topics coming up. You'll also get free access to every course we ever produce in the future. You'll never pay for another course. You'll also get lifetime access to our webinars and our forum. And we're going to chuck in a free t-shirt and a sticker pack as well. Uh, total value on that package is over 8,000 US dollars. A uh, one-time payment of 1,997 US dollars. Again, we've got payment plan options because we know that is uh, a fairly large chunk of cash to come up with amazing value for money. Our last package on the left hand side, if you want to wet your feet with this but you don't quite have enough for either of those other two packages, you can purchase our Race Driving Fundamentals course on its own. I've already gone over what's included so I won't cover it again and that course is 99 US dollars or you can break that up with eight weekly payments of 12 US dollars. So really cost effective way to get started. The starter package though as I mentioned is only available for the next three days so if you want to purchase you will have to move quickly. If you're watching on our website you'll see a yellow claim your package button at the top of the chat. If you're watching on YouTube the team will drop a link into the chat that you can follow. All right, I do appreciate everyone's patience. I just needed to, uh, to show you that package that we've got. I know it is amazing value for money. And like I've said, this is going to be one of the most cost effective ways of slashing your lap times. So and remember, uh, if you don't like them for any reason, there's zero risk. We've got that 60 day money back guarantee as well. All right, for now though, we're going to jump into our questions and answers. I'll just mention uh, as an added bonus for that starter package, uh, for for the first 10 people that purchase, we do have an HPA t-shirt just like the one I'm wearing here and an HPA sticker pack up for grabs. Only 10 of those available so you will have to move quickly and uh, regardless where you're watching, we will ship that free of charge to your door. All right, I think we'll get into these questions now. JG, what have we got? We'll, uh, we'll go through these together. I think you're a mine of information as well, so let's, uh, let's <laughs> leverage off your, your uh, experience as well. No, yeah, we have, we have a, lot of, a lot of great questions here. And oh, I'll just add one thing about, about the, the HPA packages. One of my favorite things about them that Andre didn't really cover is, yeah, you have access to all this stuff live when it happens, but all of these webinars that they do are also archived. And they're not only archived, but they're annotated. So where if you don't want to sit through two hours of Andre talking about alignments, you just want to see what does tow uh, affect my car? That's tagged in there. You can boom, go right to it. And it's, it's a fantastic place to like, just start researching something. Um, and they, they do a great job at organizing it. Honestly, I, I am jealous because uh, 
because I, I wish we would have had this idea first. But you, you guys are doing a great job with it, and thank you for sharing it with us, so we can we can still leverage it. Okay, uh, a ton of great questions here. I want to go back to one earlier that's actually been getting a little bit of traction in the chat, and that was about uh, gear skipping during downshifts. I am I am a committed gear skipper. Most of the cars that I've ever raced are all synchro tran transmissions. Um, even if you're going from like say fifth to third or fifth to second, that's happening so quickly that by the time you go five four four three three two, you don't. That's that's happening over the course of a, a couple seconds. What so I if your transmission can handle it and your your timing can handle it, I see no issues with gear skipping. What about about you, Andre? I mean, you your uh, your your eighty six there is probably a synchro trans, so. What's what's your uh, uh, approach, <laughs> or is it a, is it a doggy <clears throat> for our grassroots? Our grassroots eight six um, <clears throat> has a whole bunch of paddle shifted se sequential in it. So yeah, maybe not oh. maybe not that grassroots in that respect. So, uh, however, we, we've developed that car from the point that it did have a, an H pattern gearbox in it, which was synchro mesh. So yeah, absolutely. Uh, my technique actually was for there's a very fast section of our local race track. We're doing about 190 kilometers an hour on the on the run up to that uh, section, and uh, we're basically in sixth gear with our H pattern, and then we're coming out into a hairpin where we're exiting that hairpin in second. So, absolutely, I, I totally agree with the gear skipping uh, because otherwise we're rowing the car down sixth, down to fifth, down to fourth, third, and then finally into second. Now, segueing back into the, the body of the, the uh, webinar where we looked at uh, that data trace from the heel and toe, and we know that even with a professional race driver, we're going to see some level of uh, reduction in our brake pressure during a heel and toe application. So if we're going sixth, fifth, fourth, third, second, we've got each of those shifts where we're heel and toe and blipping the throttle, a reduction in our brake pressure, it's going to affect our braking performance. Whereas if we go from sixth down to second in one shot, maybe we do it in, in two separate shifts, but we're skipping a few gears in there, it's going to allow us to concentrate on modulating that brake pressure much better. Uh, obviously with a, a proper sequential gearbox, be it paddle shift or lever actuated, uh, we're forced to go down through the gears. But uh, yeah, where, where possible, particularly for those big braking zones from uh, high gear right down into first or second, then yeah, I think skipping gears is, is totally acceptable. Yeah, every, every time you do something in a race car is an opportunity to do something wrong. So the, the fewer <laughs> yeah. things, yeah, the fewer things you can do, the better. A uh, little bit off topic here, but I'm I'm actually curious to hear hear your answer. Gabriel wants to know how does one get into professional motorsports? The easy answer, Gabriel, is uh, to be very rich, and very rich. You're, that the, you're, you, that's it. That, that's all it takes. Uh, so yeah. I, I mean, I know how things work here in the U.S., where the actual term professional motorsports is kind of a misnomer because racing at all levels is essentially club racing just some of it happens to be on tv most of the people doing it are are paying to be there maybe a few of them are getting paid but but by and large even at the highest levels of sports car racing in the u.s uh most of the people are are funding that effort on their own what are what are things like in 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 new zealand is it is it similar i mean is is mo is even pro racing essentially glorified club racing down there look i, I think the, there's two things i'll say about that first of all the the best way to make a small fortune in motorsport <laughs> is to start with a big fortune uh 99.9 yeah. percent .9 of people in motorsport around the world are paying for their drives so it is very difficult uh, almost irrespective of your level of talent to actually make it as a professional driver where you're getting paid enough to, to have a good living. So even a lot of the professional drivers we see uh, are probably working on a shoestring budget where their sponsors are paying for their drive and they probably don't have a lot left over. So that's important to understand. Uh, and these days, unfortunately, as motorsport has become more and more expensive, the days of, of just outright sheer talent being enough uh, to get you a seat. Uh, unfortunately, those are, are, are often long gone, and, and you only need to look at F1, where, uh, without offending anyone, uh, Nikita uh, Mazaspin, for example, uh, 
pretty much there's no there's no argument that his driver is a paid for driver and that is why he is with Haas. Uh, so to, to come back, uh, here in New Zealand there really is no professional level of motorsport, uh, pretty much there's no paid drives. So we're, we're a very small country, 5 million people and, and that's pretty much why. We've also got no manufacturing base so there's no big sponsorship dollars here in New Zealand. Uh, that being said, I think as a country, New Zealand's punched well above its weight. We've got uh, a couple of top drivers who have made it into the Australian Supercars series. Shane Van Gisbergen uh, is one. Scott McLaughlin, who has now made his rookie debut in IndyCar in the US, and he has won Rookie of the Year. Uh, I think the path to professional motorsport is always, almost always the same though, and uh, karting has always been the, the feeder to professional racing, or almost always, there's a few exceptions, but karting's probably the place to get started, uh, but unfortunately, yeah, as I've said, talent will get you so far, and uh, beyond that you need a big checkbook or potentially parents with a pretty large checkbook. Yeah, and, and I, I don't mean to be discouraging to anybody. The the, no. the good news on, on the flip side of that is club racing and even just access to, to racetracks uh, with your streetcar has never, ever been more accessible everywhere in the world than it is right now. This is this is yeah. a golden age of, of track access. Um, so even if you're just taking your streetcar and slowly modifying it um, to, to be more capable on track, you can yeah almost no matter where you are in the world you have access to a track fairly affordably and fairly regularly um let's uh move on oh uh, okay here's a great question from from lucas and i would love to talk to you about this a little bit lucas um says he's been away from racing for about a year and a half plans to get back in the next month or so what exercises would you suggest someone rusty should do to get back up to speed and i, I would say aside from just you know n normally being in in good health uh the first thing i would tell somebody is go sim racing uh how about you Andre? yeah yeah, uh, sim racing was something that I, I had uh, as a topic that we were going to talk about, but uh, as we've discussed, we went a little bit long, so I didn't really dive into it. But um, yeah, so sim racing, I believe, is a really viable way of improving your racing. And, and I mean, it, it's, it's evolved so much in the last decade, and particularly over the last couple of years with uh, COVID, we've seen a lot of people obviously can't go racing, so they've, they've jumped on the sim. And uh, we've got uh, our own sim at the, at the workshop, and I've used it extensively, particularly for two reasons. Uh, one has been learning tracks that I haven't been to before. Uh, the endurance series that I'm involved with, that, that involves three racetracks that initially I'd never driven at before. And before going to the first round at uh, Teratonga Park, which is about two and a half hours south from here, uh, I'd put in about two or three hundred laps around that track on a set of Corsa. It's not perfect, but I had a really good understanding of the track layout, had a good understanding of brake markers, reference points, and also I understood where the key corners that I really wanted to focus my efforts on were on that track. Uh, and, and that really got me up to speed a lot quicker. Rather than wasting an entire practice day uh, learning the track, I was basically able to come out of the pits uh, on the first practice session and be relatively up to speed within that first 20 minute session. So yeah, I think that's really important. Uh, the other thing I've been using that for as well, uh, with our events being well, they're called endurance races. It's an hour long. I know there's some people are going to argue that an hour event is not an endurance race, but that's what they're calling it, so it is what it is. But uh, I found that uh, getting my concentration levels uh, on point for a full hour of racing uh, does take a little bit of time. It's very easy to have your attention just drift away a little bit and miss a braking marker by two or three meters, and all of a sudden you've, you've dropped uh, three or four tenths on that particular lap. And uh, just doing uh, eye racing and in a league where we were doing endurance events similar length, uh, time and time again getting practice on the sim really brought me up to speed so yeah powerful way and also I think it's worth mentioning uh, you don't need to start by spending a fortune on your sim there are some really cheap options in terms of wheels and pedals uh, that'll at least get you started and, and out there doing it yeah all right so uh, Dave and Derek uh, both have real similar questions here about about um trail breaking coasting um being being on the 
on the throttle through through a corner. Uh, again, so coasting on a racetrack is one of those things that that is another huge topic in itself. Coasting yeah. from it. it it's it's easy to say coasting is always bad, but coasting is actually one of the most granular, high end techniques that uh, you'll you'll ever approach on a racetrack because there are very specific applications for it, and uh, and generally, if you don't already know them, you shouldn't be trying to exploit them. Um, yeah. So maybe 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 a future one of these we'll we'll talk about talk about coasting a little bit. But so the the, the easy way to get into the answers for for Derek and and Dave is in general you should always be doing doing something even if you're in a constant radius corner. The the fact that you are producing friction uh, from from side force on those tires is going to be naturally resisting forward motion of the car. So you're going to have to be feeding a little bit of throttle into the car just to keep a, a constant speed. So, yep. The and and there was also a, an earlier question uh, somewhere as as to whether or not you know is slow in fast out still still the right way to to approach things. And uh, the easy answer to all of these is. Those are fantastic places to start. Um, if if you're just learning a track, you know, go, taking late apexes everywhere, and w which is sort of a natural extension of a slow in, fast out technique, yeah. just make your apexes as late as possible. And then if you see that you're not using all of the all of the exit, start backing those apexes up a little bit. Um, and and you just want to minimize the time that you're not doing anything behind the wheel. Uh, so yep. yeah, I, I, I would I would say for for those and Andre, I'd love to love to hear kind of kind of what you think about about those those longer corners where you're you're just you're you're in areas of sort of maintenance throttle. You know how do you how do you hmm. a, approach that to maximize your effectiveness in those situations? Uh, I feel like I've said this time and time again, but I could speak for half an hour on this. So let's try and keep it brief. So there's two two different. Two different aspects there. So the, the the argument that we hear is if if you're not accelerating, you're braking, and and you're never doing nothing. That that's something I hear thrown around a lot. And and this was actually something that our pro driver that we went through that course with uh, really drummed into me is that yes, the can and sometimes is a place where uh, literally coasting is the right thing to do. Uh, let's talk about your long. Uh, constant radius corner though where obviously yes we're going to be maintaining some throttle uh, we saw a section of uh, the racetrack our local racetrack uh, in that video that I showed which is an example of this it's a very very long it's about 120 degree corner we take it at about 140 kilometers an hour and we're maintaining somewhere between maybe uh, 15 to 20 percent throttle through there and this is a really good opportunity to see exactly how uh, your throttle application manipulates the handling balance of the car. Because it's such a long corner, what we can do is just gradually, slowly apply a little bit more throttle which will build up our speed and you're going to find the limit of the car's grip. Be that front end or, or rear end, you're either going to get the car starting to run wide or under steering wide. And when we get to that point, we can manipulate the throttle and back off a little bit. That'll transfer a small amount of weight forward that's going to reinstate grip. So basically by manipulating the throttle just very small amounts, we can just get the car set up right on uh, the limit of adhesion. Uh, exactly the same with uh, if the car tends to be a little bit loose or oversteering. Uh, however, it's just difficult. There's, there's no, not a lot of black and white, as I've already said before, with with uh, motor racing. And to state outright that we should never be just coasting, uh, that's not always uh, the, the case. And one of the things uh, which our pro driver did, did bring in a constant, because he does a lot of driver coaching as well, uh, a constant thing he sees drivers doing wrong, novice drivers doing wrong, is feeling like they need to get on the throttle too soon. Uh, so if we look at uh, a geometric position for our apex in the centre of the corner, that's the point where the car is producing maximum lateral g-force. And as we know from the uh, the traction circle that we looked at earlier in the in the webinar, uh, when we've got maximum lateral g-force, there's nothing left for accelerating or braking. So by definition, uh, at the apex, if we are at the limit of adhesion, we can't accelerate the car. Now we can hold constant speed, that's a little bit different, but we can't accelerate the car. 
And what we see is this is normally an upshot of the driver coming into the corner, braking too early, over slowing the car, and basically getting to the apex of the corner, realizing by the time they get to the apex that they've made a mistake and they're too slow, and then they get back on the throttle too soon. And what this tends to do is then compromise the corner exit. So getting on that throttle too, too early is going to end up with the car either oversteering or understeering wide of the corner, re resulting in you having to lift back off the throttle. So when you've got that situation, you get to the apex of the corner, this is a slightly different angle from the question, but I think it's important to mention. If you're getting to that point and you realize you're too slow and you're wanting to get on the throttle, just understand for the next lap, the problem was actually the previous sector. The problem was you either braked too early or you over slowed the car. Fix that and then the rest of the corner will naturally come to you. Um, I also just wanted to mention about the apex location or the, the, the slow in, fast out. And again, what that really comes down to is uh, the, the, the corner, the particular corner on the track we're looking at. So. It's not just about the corner. That's not the only thing we need to focus on. It's what does that corner lead on to? So a classic example would be a slow corner leading onto a long straight. In that situation, it would be more typical to brake and brake slow the car more so we can turn the car tighter, aim for a late apex further around the corner, which opens up the corner exit and therefore allows us to get on the throttle sooner. Now if we had a speed overlay of what that would look like, we would be giving away a little bit of time and speed at the corner entry where we need to over slow the car in order to rotate it through the corner. But by doing that and then opening up the exit of that corner, we can then get back to full throttle sooner and that will give us an advantage the whole way up the next straight, which is why it lends itself so well to slow corners leading onto long straights. Without getting too deep into it, obviously if we've got a double corner uh, or a corner leading into another corner, we may need to manipulate our apex location to suit that combination. So that, that's my thoughts on that, JG. Hopefully uh, that you, you can agree with that. Yeah, no, that, that was some great explanations. And so I I know we have to we have to cut things off here soon. So I'm going to basically combine all the rest of our questions in into one because they they all sort of, sort of lead lead to the same place. Uh, Chris with, with another great question um, here. So so Chris is mentioning that in autocross he's been taught uh, to only ask the tire to do one thing at a time. Um, why is trail braking not as as prevalent? Uh, and to the, to follow that up, we've got several questions from uh, Namdi and Billy and um, uh, Paul about the difference between front wheel drive and re rear wheel drive, all wheel drive, mid engine cars, rear engine cars, how they how they affect things. So to start with Chris's question, um, I, I I I not to take anything away from any of, of your instructors, but I think. They were maybe phrasing that poorly, where they uh, maybe in, in, instead of in, instead of saying that you've been taught to only ask the tire to do one thing at a time, I think what's more correct a uh, more correct way to to express that is a tire can only do one hundred percent of anything at a at only only it, it can only use a hundred percent of its grip in one direction at a at a time yeah if you if you if you if you'd have to 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 do something else you need to take some force away from one direction to apply it to to another direction so if you're using 100 percent of that tire's potential yes it can only be in, in in one direction so that's where we get into stuff like like trail braking uh or or even feeding throttle coming coming out of a corner if you start to accelerate yep. a car you've got to take some cornering speed away um and if you start to brake a car you've got to got to take take some cornering force force away as well and i think where that ties into the front wheel drive versus rear wheel drive versus mid engine versus um uh front engine the the difference all of those cars are using the same tires and all of those tires have to adhere to the same laws of physics what's going to be different about those those cars is how quickly and how thoroughly they transfer the load to those different tires. So uh, a rear engine car under braking is going to transfer less of a load relative uh, 
to its its entire weight to the front. So your braking performance is not going to be necessarily better or worse. It's just going to be different. And you, and you have to realize that those front wheels are not going to load quite as fast. And that's mostly something you're, you're going to be dealing with through the mechanical setup of, of, of the car rather than, than uh, technique. Now, when it comes to trail braking, a front wheel drive car versus a, 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 re, you know, a rear engine car into a corner, Again, that could be a whole other evening of chat on its own. Um, in a front-wheel drive car, sometimes you are forced to do things that would seem unnatural in other cars, just to force the issue of weight transfer to put put load on certain tires. But yeah, so no matter how a car is laid out, no matter how much a car weighs or where that weight is, those four tires all have to adhere to the same level of physics, the same uh, or the, the the same laws of, of friction that uh, that any other car does. It's just going to be what is the interaction that you're looking for, and how quickly is is it happening? Does that does that sound sound right to you, Andre? Is that have, have I explained that yeah. correctly? Yeah, I I, th I think I'll, I'll go a little deeper as well because. There's a lot more to it that's going to make up the, the, the natural handling balance of a car other than just whether it's front engine, mid engine, rear engine, whether it's front wheel drive, four wheel drive or rear wheel drive and that's the part that we, we, we it's very easy to overlook. So. Uh, the type of suspension system, whether we're talking uh, double wishbone or McPherson strut, multi-link, uh, live rear end, uh, the camber gain curve, uh, the way the roll center height and the gradient of the roll centers front to rear is set up, anti-roll bars, all of these aspects are going to ultimately affect uh, the, the natural handling balance of a particular car. So that, that's important to understand in and of itself. And then it's a case of understanding the tools that are available to us as the driver in order to modify and exploit that natural handling balance to suit our own our own aims. And we've talked about trail brake and how that can help a car rotate or maybe it can reduce a natural tendency to oversteer. Uh, and that goes really irrespective of, of the type of car we're dealing with. It's about testing and finding what that handling balance is, what the car is doing that you like, what the car is doing that you don't like, and then understanding what you can do as a driver in order to, to manipulate uh, that. So uh, I'd probably just add that in there. Again, I know it's not very helpful, but uh, when, when it comes to racing, it, there's a lot of shades of gray here, and, and just understanding those background principles is, is so key. Yeah, and I, I think the, the the portion of this discussion uh, on trail braking and how you explained it with um, with your traction units. In fact, uh, if if you guys sell those traction units, I would like to order a few because those seem very very handy when it comes to setting a car up. But I, 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 that's a great way to think about it. And no matter how your car is configured, you still you still only have 100% of that of each individual tire's grip available. Yeah, and how your car is configured. The only thing that's going to affect is is how the load gets to those tires. Eventually, it's it's still up to the driver to manage mm. that load on, on on each of those tires. Yeah, one of the most important things on a race car, and you'll hear just about any professional race engineer uh, talk about, is, is how critical the tire is. And it really comes down to, it doesn't matter if, if it's your, your road car that you're taking to a track day or you've got a half a million dollar GT3 car, ultimately no matter what else is done to the car, it's the contact patch between those four tires that's going to dictate how quickly you can get that car around the track. So understanding the way the tire works, understanding the implications of load transfer and uh, optimizing that tire contact patch it is really the key to getting the most out of that tire which in turn allows you to get the most out of the car. Uh, I'll just also mention a part of that uh, other topic about only asking the, the tire to do one thing at a time. Uh, obviously during the, the webinar today we have talked mainly about trail braking uh, and again we've got a limited time here so we can't cover every potential topic but as you alluded to there JG we have exactly the same uh, only in reverse when we're on the corner exit whereas once we get past the apex we want to start accelerating the car 
Again, if we're at maximum lateral cornering force, there's nothing available from the tyres to allow acceleration. So we need to naturally start unwinding some of that steering lock. So we're not asking for so much lateral G-force so that we can begin to start adding throttle and beginning to produce some longitudinal accelerating G-force. And again, that's just riding the other edge of the rim of the traction circle uh, for our acceleration as opposed to our braking. So yeah, uh, de definitely the tyre as you say, it, it's able to do a certain amount and we want to just exploit as much of that as we can in terms of our combined corner entry and our combined corner exit. Have we got any, uh, got any more in there uh, JG? A uh, couple we can probably deal with quickly. Somebody asked earlier and I, I, I apologize I forget who but uh, they were asking about uh, how they can find out about different different brake pad compounds and how they will affect your braking and what they might be ideal for. Every manufacturer of high performance brake uh, pads is going to have a chart somewhere on on their website that essentially shows what temperature range those brakes are going to operate in, what what they're best for, and um, sort of what friction profile they're they're going going to have. Uh, I you know our Corvette project car uses Willwoods. Right now we're using their BP40 compound, which is a, a compound that needs a little bit of temperature in it to work, but it doesn't need much. And as soon as it, it gets that temperature, it stays very consistent throughout a several hundred degree range of temperature. Uh, if you're trying to find a pad that that um, is more of an endurance racing pad, that pad might need more heat to work, but it might last quite a bit once it gets up to speed. One thing I'll, I'll say is every one of the most common questions I get when I go to the racetrack is I want a pad that I can drive on the street and then take to the track and it works great in both places. And sorry, the that old unicorn exist. pad. Yeah, yeah. If, you know what? If if uh, if that pad existed, I would have bought stock in that company and I yeah. I would be uh, th there would be a much more elaborate banner behind me. Um, so you're you're always yeah, I think in, a, in always, a lot of ways i think it's actually yeah. it's harder when you are trying to build a multi-purpose car that you want to be able to daily drive or at least drive on the weekends and also regularly track that car you, that's yeah. actually harder than building a, a dedicated race car and, and the brake pads are, are really one of the the, the the trickier parts I think so yeah you're absolutely right um, I don't know what it's like in the US but here in New Zealand as well we obviously don't have local manufacturers we've only got distributors and uh, I've found the best results have come from uh, dealing with a, a company that specializes in brake uh, components and is actually involved in racing and the reason that works well is that uh, you don't necessarily just have to rely on the manufacturer's chart uh, of, of compound versus friction of coefficient versus heat temperature range. Uh, you can actually leverage off their experience with well we've had this pad in a similar car to yours and it, it works exceptionally. So that, that's worked well for us in terms of getting pads that we can trust are going to work without having to spend you know hundreds if not thousands of dollars testing a bunch of different compounds to find the one we like. Oh sure yeah and and it's really very similar here where in the club racing scene there's there's every chance that the rep for any given company when they're not working a trade show or or sitting behind their desk they're out on track with their own car doing the same thing so there's there's a great yeah. knowledge base there and uh you, the, you know the, the the thing i recommend everybody to to solve that one brake pad for everything situation is just get two sets of brake pads. They're not that hard to change. Uh, switch yep. them out the Friday before your track weekend. Switch them back in Sunday afternoon. And both of your sets, both your street set and your track set, are going to last longer and perform better. And you're going to be happier with the car. And ultimately, you're going to spend less money uh, either constantly changing your, your pads if you're trying to use street pads on the track or constantly changing your rotors if you're trying to use race pads on your on your on cold rotors uh, that's just just tearing them up so um, yeah, yeah two, I think that's something that a lot of people overlook is if you are using a brake compound that's designed for race use it's designed for a higher 
operating temperature window and if you're not operating in that window which is where you'd probably be daily driving on the street uh, yeah as you kind of alluded to there you, you're going to end up chewing through rotors at a, at a phenomenal rate and that gets really expensive really quickly all right JJ I think uh, we're, we're probably going to wrap up uh, we're, we're just going a little bit long so I think we've got time for let's say one more question so if we've got another one in there that uh, you'd like to give us uh, let, let me find a good one here. Um, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll go with John's question here. And, uh, he's asking about, about tips, uh, for endurance racing since, since Andre is doing, doing some, some endurance racing. Uh, it's yep. always here, here, good, to, good to hear some thoughts and I'll, I'll elaborate on this a little bit by, by, by saying we've, we've talked about, about these techniques sort of uh without a a time factor on them we, we've talked about the the physics and the relationship between you know the the contact patch un, under load in a moment but how how is is extended time going to change your approach to something like this and and how do you yeah. how do you sort of real-time monitor how 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 you're able to apply these techniques over the course of a session, whether that session is 15 minutes or an hour and a half. Okay. Um, all right, so there's a bunch I could talk about here, so I'll just try and keep it to a few key points. And first of all, I'll just reiterate, our endurance racing, as I've said, it's an hour race, so a lot of people would sort of snicker a little bit to themselves when we call that an endurance race. But an hour is still a, a fair bit of time in the car. And what's important to understand with, with a race that is that length is that the handling balance of the car is naturally going to uh, change. Uh, we start with 110 kilograms of fuel or 100 kilograms of fuel in the car. That burns down over the course of the race. So the handling balance will change. And one of the key things uh, which I've just come off the back of that win, uh, so I'll talk to that experience, is managing the tyres as well. Uh, while a sprint race that's six or eight laps, we could literally drive the car at 10 tenths or, or maybe beyond the limit for the entire race and probably not compromise the tyre too much. If we try and do that for an hour or more of racing, uh, we're going to completely rinse the tyres, the grip's going to go away and while you might be fast in the first five to ten laps, uh, you're really going to suffer in, in the end. So uh, one of the key things I'll point out is in, in that race that I've just done, we had one competitor that was actually a little bit faster than us. Uh, I managed to get a jump on him off the start and stay ahead for about the first three or four laps, but it was really clear straight away that the car was faster than me. Uh, I was holding him up, I was driving defensive lines and I was overdriving my car in order to try and stay in front. So about four laps in, uh, I, I made the conscious decision that it, it wasn't worth trying to fight. I wasn't going to be able to hold him off for 60 minutes and uh, the smarter decision was to let him go and concentrate on my own race and that's exactly what I did. Pulled back the pace a little bit and that meant that I was driving within the capability of the tyres uh, and ultimately we ended up winning based on a pit stop strategy. Uh, it's a different topic but uh, yeah just just understanding that trying to drive a defensive race for a, a, a whole long stint that's going to be really difficult. Uh, the other part just with the tyre management there is uh, there's a very that very long right hand corner that we've already talked about a couple of times at our local track, the one that goes through 120 degrees, uh, that's got the left front tyre in particular really heavily loaded for several seconds each lap and Again, if you're just driving on the absolute limit or beyond, uh, it's very quick to notice lap after lap that the performance of the car through that, that corner goes away. The car becomes more and more prone to understeer. And just by backing off maybe maybe just a, a tenth or two per lap, uh, it doesn't beat up on the tyre so, so much. And that allows us to drive faster overall. Even if we're giving away a little bit of lap time, it just means that the tyre's not going to degrade. So there's a lot more to endurance racing compared to sprint racing than just your outright pace. It is a bit of a longer game, unsurprisingly. And, uh, and understanding sort of aspects like that uh, are important. Pit strategy and strategy in general is another big topic, but again, we could uh, we could go on about that one alone for hours. I, I think we'll we'll probably leave it there, JG. 
Uh, and I, I want to finish up just by saying a huge thanks to everyone who has come along. Hopefully everyone's enjoyed what they've learned. I am sorry if there are a few questions we didn't get to. Uh, just a reminder again, if you did enjoy what you've learned today, uh, that starter package is only available for the next three days. 397 US dollars if you purchase in one lump sum. Use that payment plan, you can break that down into as many as eight weekly payments of just 49 US dollars. I'll mention if you do that as well, you get instant access to all of the course material as soon as your first payment is processed no need to wait eight weeks to start learning and remember you're completely protected with that 60 day no questions asked money back guarantee so zero risk while we're at it as well uh, another prop for grassroots motorsport it's been great having you uh, along today JG helping out you've had some uh, great input yourself and uh, for all those who have watched uh, yeah go go give uh, GRM a, a follow as well they put out some really great information so uh, thanks again JJ. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for having us. Always a pleasure to talk to you guys. Um, it, it's uh, I actually had to look it up. Uh, we are nine thousand miles away from each other, so just <laughs> just to be able to to chat with somebody uh, what a third of the way around or around the world, uh, and and have some some really fun uh, interactions with a with a great and knowledgeable audience. It's it's always a pleasure so thanks for thanks for having us aboard uh we're on the web at grassrootsmotorsports.com if you're over on youtube hit that subscribe button uh like like they all say and uh, you get first crack we we have tech stuff and feature cars and you know expanded stuff from the magazine going up on on youtube all the time so welcome to check us out there and uh yeah thanks to our friends at hp academy for having us aboard tonight yeah, thanks a lot, JJ. And uh, for everyone watching, hopefully we can see you online again in the future. Thanks for coming along.